Let's start with those people who cannot work from home being allowed to go uh, to work. I wonder if it was, uh, I was going to try and make a silly joke about um, uh, uh, the um, modeler um, visiting his, being visited by his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, that sort of work is allowed. Annie, can you just check that uh, I have succeeded? Oh. Just about to do that. I'll let you know in a second. Apologies, I've somehow managed to set up the um, webinar so that everybody has to be admitted individually. I see Magda has just joined us on this, which completes our, Hello. our speakers. Hello, Magda. I am just going to change the background. Oh. It looks very pretty, but it's not what we need. Okay. Great. It's oh, six o'clock now. I think I'm going to start um, in a, well in one minute. Yeah. yeah. Magda, you're, where are you now? You look like you're on a beach. <clears throat> oh, you're in Radix Studio. <laughs> Fantastic. Right, everyone, welcome to uh, Radix sen sen seminar on how we're going to um, pay for the COVID crisis. Um, thank you all for coming. We've got a full house, a limit of 100 people. Um, and we've got four excellent um, panelists and we've also got um, an excellent audience. Um, I hope everyone will find this interesting. Um, and um, I, just a couple of things I wanted to say. First of all, we are um, recording this session. So if you don't want to be recorded, um, then uh, please turn off your, um, your, your camera. Um, First of all, we are... Um, and then could everyone mute their microphones, please, who's not talking, um, so we don't get any feedback, as I've just had. In particular, I think some people are joining by phone, so could you mute your um, phone if you can? Um, and um, if you are obviously being asked to uh, um, speak, can you, you can unmute your, yourself. Um, my internet's not, uh, due to Virgin, not particularly um, uh, robust, so it might fail at some point, but fortunately we've got the excellent, wonderful Ben Rich to take my place as chairman if, uh, if, if it should, should do. Um, and I'm going to try and uh, run this like a question time type format where um, uh, there are some people who um, pre-submitted questions, I'll turn to them, they'll ask their question, then the panel will answer, um, and, uh, and then we can have a discussion. And I'll, um, if you want to make a, ask a question or make a point, please then um, raise your hand or um, uh, contact Ben on the chat. Um, uh, and we'll, so this is a bit of an experiment. We haven't done this before, um, and I haven't done this before with so many people in the audience, so we hope that that works. But first of all, we're going to start with um, the panelists doing a short um, talk. Um, about uh, 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 the situation. Um, and I want to start with patients, Patience Wheatcroft, uh, who is the uh, 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 editor of, so former editor of the Sunday Times and editor in chief of Wall Street Journal. She's now uh, sits in the House of Lords representing the Conservative Party, um, um, but uh, is on the roll of honor, having been um, accused by the Daily Mail of being an enemy of the people. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's wonderful um, uh, uh, patience. Um, and so um, the situation as we see it now, we, uh, you know, today the government said we're coming out of lockdown. Well, we're starting to ease lockdown uh, on Monday, um, but realistically, this is going to be a long process. We're not going to get back to business as usual for a while. Industries such as uh, the travel industry, for example, or, or, or hospitality is going, you know, it's a long time before that's going to be come back online. Um, and in the meantime, um, government debt is increasing because of uh, 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 government are, are busy borrowing and spending. They're going to have very reduced tax. They are currently, and that's going to massively blow out government debt. 
there is going to be a lot of insolvencies uh, from corporates, municipalities, uh, uh, some sovereign emerging markets. And there's a lot, huge amount of government um, involvement um, yeah, in the economy. They've been intervening in the financial markets. They're having to support lots of um, uh, businesses who, are, who are, whose continuing existence is due to uh, government and support. But so, uh, patients, so starting with you, um, you know, what are the uh, sort of parameters under which you know, decisions that governments will have to make uh, going forward? Um, and uh, uh, you know, how's the situation going to play out? And, and what could and should um, governments be, be doing to uh, 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 once they are faced with a, a, you know, the, the situation as we're coming out of COVID? So I'll hand over to you, patients, for uh, some Thank words. Thank you. And um, good evening, everyone. Um, I should say I'm perfectly happy to be called an enemy of the people by uh, the Daily Mail, but I can't claim ever to have been the editor of the Sunday Times, sadly, Sunday Telegraph. Um, oh, sorry, my, uh, I read Sunday Telegraph. <laughs> I can't think read the my government, government has got to continue stimulating the economy and looking after the people for quite a while yet, until there's a vaccine there are going to be very, very big demands on public spending. I think it's absolutely going to be necessary to print more money, and that's got to happen. But also, I do think we need to see an increase in taxes. And that's not so much because of raising a huge amount of money. It won't. Certainly nowhere near the trillions we, we're going to need. But it's because of the message it will send. And we do need to show that we have, a, well, the government needs to show that it has an understanding that the pain has to land hardest on those who can best afford it. That didn't happen after the last recession. And people understandably felt very aggrieved that the people who suffered under austerity were not the people in the city of London who many had held to blame quite rightly for a lot of what, what went wrong. Now, I think what, what has become clear is that whatever the government does, it needs to be shown to be bearing in mind that austerity hit the poor, the vulnerable hardest, and COVID-19 is doing that too. It's impacted most on those with underlying conditions such as diabetes and obesity, which tend to be more prevalent amongst the less prosperous households. It's hit BME people harder than the average. It's impacted most on the most vulnerable, and that has to be addressed. We need to move towards a more equal society. Now, a lot of people are saying that now, whether they'll be saying it when they're back at work and everything is going a little better for them, I don't know, and that's why the government has to be brave. I suspect, given the nature of this government, it will have severe splits, and there will be those who simply want to pander to their core middle class former voters rather than the new ones, the Red Wall. So I can see grave disagreements within the government, but if they don't look after the poor, we will have potentially real uh, riots in the streets. And I think at that stage, I should probably hand over Nick. Okay, thank you very much. That's very, uh, very interesting. Could I just sort of quiz you a little bit on, on that? Um, what, um, <coughs> I mean, you, you suggested raise taxes. Is that really the only thing they should do? Or, or are there, you know, other, other, you know, quite radical measures that they should consider. Oh no, I said that they should print money. And with that money, they need to stimulate businesses. Um, they need to make sure that people who go to work are properly rewarded. So I'd like to see <coughs> the minimum wage go up. It's not really, a, what we know it's not a living wage. That's why there's a separate living wage. I think they should definitely invest more in uh, the Green Deal, but predominantly, I think what they should do is come up with positive ideas for getting businesses back to work 
I'd like to see far more construction. You know, we've talked about housing for a very long time and not actually built the houses. So I think there could be certainly a great deal more infrastructure spending. Getting people back to work that way will need to turn quite a lot of offices into residential space because people are not going to be going back to offices on the same scale. So I think we need some constructive thinking from government. Ideally, I'd like to see them bringing into government people with experience, because I'm afraid we've now got a government which is sadly lacking in experience. It would be wonderful to see them reaching out to people who actually have a bit of gravitas and know what they're talking about. Um, whether that will happen, I think is highly unlikely. And of course, one of the most important things I'd like to see them do tomorrow is ask for an extension to the transition period, because one of the most stupid things at the moment is that having been suffering from inflicted damage about which we had no control, although once it arrived, we might have controlled it better, we're about to inflict totally self-inflicted damage, which seems the height of madness. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not sure how much of um, what you said is in line with Conservative Party policy, but I think thank you for your frank words. Um, I'm now handing over to uh, Vince Cable for his comments, and in particular, um, you know, in light of his experience of um, being a government minister as we came out of the last financial crisis and whether, you know, we should have learned how we can have learned from that experience and, and do things differently. So Vince, over to you. And I think Vince has a couple of slides. Yes, well, thank you for inviting me on. And I hope this works. Uh, it has before. <laughs> Um, oh dear, sorry, um, it's, I, I sort of lost my downloads, um, here we are, there we are, does that, is that seeable? Yes. Yes, th th this is the sort of range of possibilities that we face. Um, I've dug out what I think is the worst economic disaster in statistically recorded history, but a lot of bad things have to happen for that to materialize. Um, if things go badly, we're faced with potentially um, the Great Depression in the United States, 30% decline from peak to trough because of the absence of supporting monetary policy and fiscal policy. Uh, Greece sacrificed on the Eurozone. Um, when you look at the comparisons, what is remarkable about the financial crisis was how little damage it actually did. Uh, and that was because the right things were done. Uh, the banks were rescued. Um, there was a big fiscal stimulus from the Chinese. Uh, and we had very aggressive monetary policy QE, uh, which had some nasty side effects, but served its, served its purpose. Um, so, you know, if we're lucky, we'll get away with um, a, a hit uh, comparable to the financial crisis. Uh, if it's badly handled and we're unlucky, we're in sort of Great Depression territory. Let me just put up one more um, if I can, it involves grilling. Here we are. I mean, these are the sort of key economic issues, I think, to focus on. I mean, on the one side, there is the rescue operation. I think, broadly speaking, our government and most other governments are doing the right things. But there is the crucial issue of the exit. I'm one of the relatively impatient ones I, I think we're in danger of not taking enough risk rather than um, the opposite uh, there is still the issue about whether uh, distress is going to become so severe that there needs to be a one-off universal payment as in the united states and japan or we just content ourselves with the um, uncertainties of universal credit uh, there is a practical question about all the money that's going to be shelled out for Virgin Atlantic and, and the rest of them. Um, do we get the money out and save them and save the jobs, or do we start attaching strings around tax loopholes and corporate governance and the rest? I'm, uh, in the short run, I think the important thing is to save them. 
um, the, fur the phasing out of furlough is going to be very, very tricky. If you do it too soon, a lot of people lose their jobs. Um, if you leave it hanging out there, companies have absolutely no incentive to get back properly into production. And there are categories of people who have not been helped, as we know, a lot of self-employed people who pay a dividend and, for example, have been neglected. Um, now, the, the bigger question, I'll just um, some, make a few points here. Um, we all know there's going to be a large amount of accumulated debt. That's assuming for the moment that governments are financed conventionally through bonds. There will be private household debt. There'll be an enormous amount of corporate debt. The big threat, as I see it, is that we get debt deflation. We know from history that you have a large amount of debt out there. People don't spend, companies don't spend, and you, you sink into very deep uh, depression. Um, we should be relaxed about debt. Um, the current levels of debt are way below what they have been in previous wars, from First, Second World War back to the Napoleonic Wars at much higher levels. Interest rates, as we know, are very low, and you can grow out of it over 20 to 30 years. But I, I agree with patients, actually, that we shouldn't be thinking about um, the debt burden. We should be using um, money creation, direct money creation. It's already happening covertly in Japan. I think our own Bank of England are doing it. They're issuing IOUs rather than buying up bonds. Um, it's the right thing to do. I think the reason why uh, there will be reticence is because governments and central banks are terrified that politicians will come out with all their favourite wheezes. You know, we want a new deal, we want a universal basic income, we want to set uh, colonies on Mars, or, you know, any, any kind of stuff that will go on forever. And if there is going to be the use of um, money creation, as there should be, it's got to be temporary and very tightly controlled by the central banks so that if inflation begins to rear its head, they can move very quickly to stop it. It has to be conditional in that way. The danger at the moment is deflation rather than inflation, but we should be prepared for both things happening. And I think my final point is that I agree again with patients that there is scope for tax measures, not because of a desperate need to rebalance the budget in the short run, that for symbolic reasons, a lot of people have been hurt. There is a big redistribution taking place, um, a big equity issue between generations. And, and as one of the older people who's been protected over the last 10 years. Um, so you know, shifting the balance of taxation towards property, land, um, wealth, a lot of it unearned in recent years. I mean, that, that we should be having um, redistribution, rebalancing, fairness in the tax system, not, a, not essentially as a revenue raising mechanism. But I hope that's uh, given enough to stimulate a few reactions. Yes, yeah, so well, thanks so much, Vince. I won't come back to you with a question because a lot of the questions that we're going to have are um, uh, uh, very relevant to that. I'm going to move on to to uh, Magda Poland. Uh, Magda, uh, uh, as well as being a uh, uh, Kung Fu Sifu, is uh, now a top economist at uh, Legal and General, and she was formerly with the IMF and uh, Goldman Sachs. So Magda, you've got a lot of experience working in emerging markets, so, um, and that's kind of a slightly, uh, you know, two important points here. First of all, that we tend to think of this as a developed world problem, but emerging markets, if anything, are going to be uh, hit more by the uh, inability to uh, cope with the virus, but also by the economic fallout. And secondly, having worked in emerging markets for a long time, uh, you know, they've got a lot of experience of what happens in, in debt crises. Um, um, and, and then, um, and finally, emerging markets, I hate that term because it refers to, you know, a country like China and a country like Niger, who are, are totally different. So you can't apply the same uh, formula, but, but, but they, they are, you know, emerging markets are increasing chunk of the global economy. So um, that will have damage on countries like Britain as well. So Magda, hang, hang, handing over to you. Yes, thanks. Indeed, uh, I fully agree with you that this is, uh, the term is much too wide as the term EM includes countries from say, South Korea, Poland, down to down to Niger and uh, Vietnam. So uh, talking about the policy challenges there is a fairly complex matter and they do have a lot of policy challenges as well. Many of them have introduced a similar style lockdown as in the developed markets. Um, and they tried to implement all the best policies they could, 
uh, given the limited means for some of them. Uh, but the cost of that is is very high, and the they cannot easily get out of this as the DMs can because they can't just print money to cover their debt. At least most of them cannot do that because they still rely on capital inflows. And if they do that, the investors may simply take flight and abandon those markets, leading to massive depreciation or a crisis in where the temporary fall in economic activity can turn into a proper solvency crisis and a sovereign bankruptcy. So these economic policy dilemmas are very strong. And probably they are the strongest in countries that kind of fall in the middle of this pack, where expectations of citizens are probably on the level of developed economies, but the financial abilities of the government are still very much in the middle income countries. So these are the countries the likes of Brazil or South Africa or maybe Turkey, where uh, the challenge is, um, is quite acute. Um, we, uh, when talking about the dilemmas, um, and distribution and cost of that. Uh, and you mentioned earlier the, the increase in uh, intra-country inequality. I think what many EMs will also face is that cross-country global inequality. Uh, by introducing these very strict lockdowns in the developed world, uh, EMs, especially countries that depend on exports and tourism, will face quite a massive hit to their growth. Uh, despite most likely suffering much um, smaller outbreaks. We have to remember that most of the EMs acted very quickly. They introduced lockdowns, they introduced social distancing measures because they are not arrogant in face of infectious diseases. They, rem they know them, they know how to deal with them using low cost measures. That comes, for example, experience with frequent cholera outbreaks, for example, AIDS. Uh, Ebola and other diseases. They also have uh, very effective states like South Korea and the experience of SARS and MERS. So um, they, uh, they, despite their very good action and much lower mortality and much uh, lower spread of the disease, they will be still carrying the cost of, uh, of the lockdowns elsewhere in the world. Dead problem indeed, this is uh, uh, quite a problem for countries that maybe have not really introduced massive fiscal stimulus because they couldn't afford it, but uh, which are just generally small players in the global financial markets. And where this, this recession and the lockdowns uh, makes it almost impossible for them to service their debt. Uh, it, just one small bond of say a couple of hundred of million of dollars for, uh, can be a massive chunk of a GDP for a smaller African economy. So dealing with that for in June this year, for example, and then cost of the outbreak can break the public finances. So who will pay for that? Um, printing money will not help because they cannot do it. So their own taxpayers will pay for that. Uh, they growth, their prosperity will suffer, although hopefully thanks to their higher potential growth, this would be easier done in the developed economies. Uh, partially the creditors will also pay uh, there is a list of uh, about 80 countries that are eligible for debt relief and G20 has agreed to uh, introduce a so-called debt standstill. That means you don't have to pay coupons and principal on your maturing debt. And these countries can also then uh, attempt to restructure their debt on a case-by-case basis. They're getting a lot of help from the IMF, some help from the World Bank. Uh, but it's still going to be a very difficult time for a number of those poor countries. Those kind of, you know, the DMs of EMs with the much more developed countries probably will not have a problem. Their debt rates should be, debt levels should be sustainable. Interest rates are low. And we should mention that in the discussion also for the UK and Western Europe, uh, what we, when we talk about debt, can we afford this debt? Can we sustain this debt? We have to look at it also from the perspective of interest rates and the cost of running it, as opposed to just the level. So there's many more aspects and variables in this discussion than just the level. Well, thank you very much, Magda. Just a quick follow-up question. If uh, there is a large wave of defaults or, or sovereign defaults in emerging markets, particularly the bigger ones like Brazil, or the, uh, then will that have um, a contagious effect on, on uh, you know, uh, developed country um, on the global economy. Economy. Uh, or global yeah, economy. I don't think actually there's going to be a large wave of defaults in mm -hmm. the in the, the so-called developed emerging markets. There is very little risk of that. 
these countries have managed to uh, clean up their finances quite well. Uh, the times of ready bonds and, and, and massive defaults and bills, I think, are well behind us. The risk is much more on the low income countries side. But given that these countries are all bucketed into the same category of emerging markets, then those defaults in the, the poorer end of the scale may still cast negative light on the, on the whole group of countries. But again, I don't think we're gonna see things like a default in Brazil or, or, or even the most exposed countries. They simply don't have as much bond, massive or huge bonds, uh, external debt, uh, the problem is much more on the private sector side, which is very developed and has access to external markets rather than the sovereigns. Okay, thank you, Magnus. That's a semi-optimistic message. Um, just now hand over to Panikos. Um, sorry about my pronunciation, Dimitriades. Um, and Panikos is a professor of economics, but previously he was uh, a governor of the Central Bank of Cyprus um, and he was a uh, uh, on the European Central Bank Governing Council. Um, and so, Panikos, you've got obviously invaluable experience about, um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, crises, how, how central banks uh, react, um, and you've got lots yeah. to say, and I think you've got a couple of slides to share with us as well. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to take part in uh, Radix events and to be in such distinguished company. It's uh, also interesting to know that uh, there isn't much diversity of opinion here. Um, although they come, we're coming from different perspectives, this seems to be probably is the, is the Radix unifying sort of uh, <laughs> <laughs> a component there that, 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 that means we, we sort of converging on our ideas. So if I may have my slides. Yes, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm also drawing on, on past experience. And in fact, past experience is very relevant for the the current handling of, of, um, of the crisis in Europe in particular, I've um, actually um, written a book a few months ago on, uh, published a book on future of the Euro and central bank independence. And only yesterday, the, um, uh, the German constitutional court, which is the highest court in Germany, sort of um, questioned, oh my, um, questioned the, the, the um, uh, decision of the ECJ or the European Court of Justice on the ECB's uh, uh, bond purchase program, uh, which sort of, um, I think, caused a bit of turmoil in markets because I think we were assuming, we were assuming so far that um, the ECB is doing again whatever it takes, uh, once again, it's at the forefront, helping countries indirectly, but, but definitely um, printing money, <laughs> right? Although it's not breaching, I think, legally, the, the treaty, it is nevertheless um, making enough money available for governments through secondary markets, right? So that, that was really not a very, not a very good um, um, sort of news yesterday. So I'm, I'm, uh, it, it, it threw into question the, the big question, the future of the euro if Germany is not, is not committed to it. So if I can have the first slide, please. So I, I like to start with something that many economists sort of, when there's an economic discussion, we we sort of ignore the health side of things. And it is a health crisis, right? It's not a banking crisis. It's a pandemic. So it is absolutely vital, that especially now that we are unlocking the economy, to do that in, in safety. And how do you do that in safety? Although I'm not an expert, I've listened to enough sort of um, um, epidemiologists, et cetera, to understand that we do really need to invest in health, right? It's in paramount. In, and we do need to have some smart investments in health that help minimize the spread of the disease once we open up, right? Testing is an obvious thing, right? And, and I don't know what is the right amount of testing, but certainly we need to do more of it, but also helping, helping companies and helping workplaces with uh, creating those workplace, making those workplaces safe. Uh, and again, minimizing, minimizing risks. And of course, investing in, in directly in public health, in hospitals, um, just in case there's a second wave. I'd say that that's relevant for other countries, for my home country, Cyprus, where they haven't done anything at all when it comes to improving the health infrastructure. They've done extremely well in terms of controlling the first wave, but I'm very fearful. And, and that's another fear I have also for Greece, not just Cyprus. Greece has done extremely well in terms of controlling the first wave. But what if there is a second wave? 
are they going to be able to cope? Because the pressure is to open up and are they doing enough? So I think that the ESM has done wonderful. I mean, Eurogroup has decided to put 2% of GDP, right, through ESM of European countries into health spending. And I see some reluctance in governments to spend that. I think that's just wrong. The money is there, it's there for them to spend it and they should spend it and they should spend it wisely. And if they do that, it would be fantastic investment. Although debt to GDP will go up maybe by 2% or even less, it would be a, a great investment if they spend it wisely because they would minimize the risks. And if you minimize the risks, it means that there's less of a chance of having a second lockdown, right? A second lo lockdown would be very detrimental. Right? So we want to avoid that. So economy and health spending, I think are in, in, inextricably linked at this point in time. And I think government should do whatever it takes to prevent um, a second peak and to open up the economy in safety. So health spending is important. Use the money for European countries that ESM is making available. There's no MOU. Some governments are fearful, and Cyprus are fearful that there would be another MOU. It's not an MOU, it's just a loan agreement. When you get a loan from a bank, you have to sign a loan agreement. The only condition is spend it on health. So that's very important, I want to stress that. Can we have the second slide, please? Right, so how about the costs? There are clearly many costs, and others have said, um, um, have talked about this already. Um, and there are direct fixed costs in supporting employment. I think, I think I'm, I'm actually, I have to say, I'm, 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 I'm never, I was never, I've never voted conservative. I'm, I have to declare this patience. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I, I'm impressed and surprised by the response of, uh, of, Bo of Boris Johnson's government when it comes to supporting the private sector, supporting the economy. I was pleasantly surprised by all the measures they, they took to support employment and, and, and to support the private sector. Um, and they, they went, you know, they went the extra mile, it seems to me, right? And of course, they, are, they seem to understand there's a big risk there. It's a risk that, that um, Vince has talked about, and I completely agree with him. It's the Vince of deflation, it's the Vince of uh, having another Great Depression of 30% uh, plummeting of, of GDP, which would make any debt level uh, much more difficult to service. So the risk of debt deflation is there and it's very serious. So we have to do as much as possible to support the economy. And, and of course, besides the direct costs, there are indirect costs um, um, to the economy because of, of, of all the output losses. And, and in fact, travel and other services are, are impacted. I mean, I don't know whether you draw the line in terms of bailouts of companies like Virgin or not. Um, I leave that to politicians among you to discuss, but clearly we need to protect the productive capacity of the economy because the economy will come back to life. Maybe it would take some time. I don't think it would be a few months. It may take up to two years until we have the vaccine for things to get back to normal or even, even more. So how many of these companies do you want to protect? Certainly we do want to protect as much as possible so that we don't have a permanent damage to the productive capacity of the economy. Um, so we need to basically limit the contraction of GDP through additional fiscal spending. And how do we do that? Well, good old central banks. Are, are we worried about monetary financing? Not at the minute. I completely agree with what, uh, what has been said before me uh, by Vince. In particular, we need to, um, we need to indulge in, in some sense in monetary financing to the extent that there is slack in the economy. That's not inflationary at all. In fact, that protects us from deflation, right? So monetary financing, yes, within limits. And I think there is, there is an, uh, an important point though here. How do you do that? And you do that, you need to do that by at the same time respecting the independence of the central bank. Because if you don't respect the independence of the central bank, there will be questions that this could actually lead to inflation in the medium to longer term. How do you do that? By not, not overindulging in those projects that Vince has mentioned, right? You know, um, going on to Mars or whatever it is that the politicians may have in mind. Um, but how do you do that? I think the ECB has, uh, is leading the way on that. They, they put a limit there. They decided what is the limit, right? They said they could review it, but that's how you respect independence. You say, this is the amount of, this is the package I'm making available, right? 
and you estimate that, you know, you've got good economists there, good technocrats, they can estimate how much money is needed that will not cause inflation, but which just simply help governments to get through this. And central banks should be helping and in, in, this, in, in this difficult times, but at the same time, politicians should respect their independence. So I think the right way forward is for the central banks to announce what the amount of money they are prepared to, um, to, to, to spend to help with the pandemic. So that's the way I think that we protect the credibility, the independence of central banks, and that we avoid in having inflation in the medium to, to long run. Thank you. That's my Okay, well, pitch. thank you so much, Panikos. That's uh, uh, excellent. So I think we've got um, our first question is going to be about this uh, inflation, deflation. Um, but just before we get on to questions, we're going to now move to a question time format. Can I just hand over to Ben Rich? Because Ben, we, uh, Radix have got two really ex exciting and excellent events coming over the next <laughs> couple of weeks. And Ben was just going to tell us about them. And also, please, Ben, can you tell the audience about the, uh, uh, the technical or... or or admin stuff that I've got wrong and missed. So yeah, go ahead. Okay. So so firstly, um, it seems a bit odd doing the adverts right in the middle, but um, <laughs> I want to make certain you don't get the chance to go away. Um, we have a follow-up event uh, next week, organised by our sister organisation in Amsterdam, which is looking at uh, the uh, age of responsible capitalism and. Um, is asking whether this crisis is an opportunity to rethink our economic and business models and whether the response would be to be more socially responsible or whether it will actually mean that trying to pay for that is uh, gets in the way. That's continuing our discussion today, but with a very different panel um, of a group of panelists from across Europe. And do have a look at our website for that, radixuk.org. And then on the 18th of May, we're looking at the future of UK-China relations and there we've got a cross-party panel, Stephen Kinnock, who's the uh, Asia spokesperson for the Labour Party these days, Alicia Kearns, who is a Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton, and William Wallace, who, as well as being a Liberal Democrat peer, uh, was a government spokesperson for the Foreign Office and uh, former um, Director of Studies at Chatham House and uh, brilliant on these sorts of stuff. We've also got Isabel Hilton, who is from China Dialogue joining us. So those events are coming up and do register for them early because we were full for this event. You can do that via our website, as I say, radixuk.org. And as we go into the discussion, if you want to join in, uh, please do submit comments on chat. I'm monitoring all the time and feeding them back to our chair. Um, so just uh, fill in points there, or if you prefer, you can text me on 07. 469-159-134. I'll put it on the chat. Back to you, Nick. Thank you very much. So um, I've now got, we're going into this question time style format. Um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, selected people to ask questions, but then um, could, if anyone has a comment or question to make, could you, you can raise your hand on, uh, and I can see it in the, uh, uh, in the participant list. So I think there's a button somewhere on your computer that you can raise your hand. So please do that. And then I'll, I'll ask the question. So the first question is from Hugh McNeil and it's about, Hugh, I'm afraid your question was quite long. Do you think you can make it a little bit more succinct? And um, uh, it was to do with inflation, I think. So. I can unmute you, I think, or if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, yeah, sorry about the length of the question. I, I fired it off before I read the 25 word mm -hmm. limit. Um, so my question relates to um, how we talk about government spending. We often hear the question, how will we pay for all the government spending, uh, which is really framed in the worldview that governments should run a balanced budget. Strictly, there's no reason why, why a sovereign, sovereign currency issuer should do that. And I think that's been recognized by uh, some of the um, comments that have been made this evening. Um, do we think that it could be politically acceptable to accept some form of inflation, either retail price or asset price inflation, rather than to levy arbitrary taxes on the economy in order to withdraw that spending power um, from circulation again? Or alternatively, if it isn't removed, do you think there's a stronger argument for the movement of taxes onto incomes from rent seeking in order to protect the recovery of the real economy? Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Hugh. So there's sort of two questions about this. So effectively, are you paying back for some of the debt through inflation? 
um, and, and secondly, it's a, a kind of active, fairer uh, uh, burden of tax. So, um, Vince, could you could I direct that to you first of all? Vince, you're you're muted. Could you unmute yourself? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it's fairly easy to see how um, you could switch from deflation to inflation quite quickly. Um, you know, food supply is going to be constrained. You know, farmers can't get immigrant labor. Uh, you know, all kind of problems on the supply side. Um, there will be fewer businesses out there, less competition. You know, retailers, restaurants were wanting to widen their margins to survive. Um, you, know, you can see how both cost and demand pressures will create inflation. Um, and that's why I, I'm very much in favour of expansionary policies. It's absolutely imperative. Uh, but it, uh, I, think, I think I'm on the same page as um, uh, Panikos and others. It's got to be very carefully managed. Um, central banks retaining a, a brief to watch inflation. Maybe, you know, it's not a great tragedy if we go up to 3 or 4% rather than 1% to 2%. But um, once you start approaching double figures again, then we're potentially in serious trouble. So keeping the independence of the central banks, uh, being willing to reverse the process is important. And that's why we don't get into... Uh, I'm not in favour of, you know, having a Green New Deal as a sort of long-term investment in greenery. It's a terribly good idea, but it's not something you finance by printing money. The, 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 the use of an injection of money is an emergency measure short-term uh, and in ways that make the maximum impact in the shortest possible time. Okay, thank you very much. So a sort of you're going for a, a, a mild inflation isn't, isn't such a bad, um, a, a, a bad thing. Uh, can I hand over to ask uh, Magda, do you want to take that question? There was also a question about, you know, do you uh, tax uh, more uh, unproductive activities, I think? Hmm. Now, uh, so let me just come back to the early part of the question. Um, you asked whether, the, uh, gov whether we should still operate under the concept of uh, uh, government balanced budgets. Um, so in any normal times, um, many governments don't even run balanced budgets, they run small deficits. Uh, because uh, a lot depends on the interplay between the cost of debt and growth or the nominal growth and the nominal cost of debt. So you can permanently run uh, imbalanced budgets if your nominal growth is higher than your um, cost of debt or interest rates. Uh, whether inflation will be tempting, uh, it can be as long as you manage to keep uh, interest rates under control. So uh, this way you can then lift inflation, lift that nominal pace of growth, and then control interest rates. And that has been done in the past. Uh, it can work if it's limited, or it can work if you have uh, captive investors that you can then force into government debt through regulations or restrictions. And while this may not be very tempting just in the UK, uh, it can probably be tempting in countries that already have high level of debt and will need to... Um, implement a lot of fiscal discipline to control the public debt, say countries like Brazil, uh, South Africa, and their inflation becomes a very tempting tool to, uh, uh, to erode part of that debt. Okay, thank you, Magda. So uh, turn to patients now. So patients, do you think high levels of inflation are one or a good idea or two are politically palatable? I don't think a high level of inflation. No, hi higher, is. sorry, yeah. Higher yeah, is yes. acceptable, but a high level <laughs> yeah. clearly not. Yes. Um, I think we could live with a little higher inflation than we've got, so long as, as Vince said, it was carefully managed. But I think Magda just raised a really important point, and that is that we really have to put a lot of emphasis on keeping interest rates under control, because indebtedness, both corporate and personal, is going to rise during this period. And if all of a sudden there's a hike in interest rate, that would really add to the bloodbath that we're going to be seeing in business and personal finances. What was uh, an affordable mortgage at one level of interest rates becomes very quickly an unaffordable mortgage, for instance. So that's where I'd like to see the emphasis. Yes, yes we can live with a little bit more inflation, but let's make sure that it's very well controlled. Okay, thank you. Um, and Panikos, did you have any thoughts? I'm sure you have thoughts yeah. on both those questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a follow-up from uh, what I said uh, what I said earlier. I think that 
we do need to um, keep an eye on on inflation. Uh, I'm not as keen as others, I'm being a former central banker, to start talking about numbers of three or four percent. I think a two percent target is there. If you miss it, and there's good reason you miss it, you write the, your letter to the chancellor and explain why. Uh, but I wouldn't be, you know, be keen to talk about higher inflation rates. I mean, as, uh, that doesn't really um, deter the central bank from doing the right thing at the moment to prevent deflation and to support governments with uh, whatever it is they need to do. But as long as we respect the independence of the central bank, then we will not have the problem of, of higher interest rates, right? Because if we stick to that 2% target and we continue to aim that, then we're not gonna have the problem with the interest rates that Magda and patients have uh, alluded to a minute ago. And th that would be a problem if the interest rates start going up. Absolutely, and then we, we might even have a, an, another, another financial crisis. That's just, that's just not right. So I think it's important to respect the independence of, of the central banks in general, uh, so that we, we stay within that 2% uh, limit, which I, I think is reasonable. Maybe if it does rise to 2.5%, it's not the end of the world, or 3%. When it goes to 4 I, I get very, very nervous. And I think a lot of people will get nervous, and markets will get nervous. Yeah, I mean, it starts going to 8%, it's just uh, it's a disaster, right? So I, I think we need to respect uh, those inflation targets. And um, there's plenty, plenty of scope within that to do things. Uh, with, with monetary financing and help governments. Governments should do things carefully, prioritize what they're spending, right? Rather than just start spending um, like crazy because that, that would create, create a problem. Okay, that, I think that's um, more or less answered to it, I hope. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, no one in the audience has raised your hands. Please you know, feel free to do so. Particularly, I'm going to also prejudice, uh, a positive prejudice towards of females, because uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, most of the questions are from men. But Magda, you've raised your hand, and you're a female. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to, uh, uh, we, because I ask how we're going to pay for it and talk about that, but there's the other side of this, which is growth. Um, so you can reduce uh, the ratios by uh, increasing pace of real growth. And uh, this is, of course, an after the war, when the so-called financial repression was very much active, there was also a very fast period of growth driven by substantial public investment, a fall in inequality, improvement in education levels uh, and technological progress. So why don't we think about the other side of this? Right? How can we come back to higher pace of growth after this crisis to help us uh, overcome the cost of the lockdowns? Great, thank Good you, Magda. Point. I've got um, a point or question from Joe Zamit Lucia, if you could. Joe, can you unmute yourself? Does that work? Yes, perfect. So, also, you might like to say something about central bank independence, which has been mentioned a couple of times. <laughs> isn't it? It's a hobby horse for yours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that old. Let, let me say something about central bank independence first, then. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Panikos mentioned clearly about the need to respect central bank independence. Um, <clears throat> and as you know, <clears throat> at Radix, we've taken the view not against central bank independence, but maybe to be clear about what it means at different times. Um, because at the moment we have good coordination, it seems to me, between fiscal policy and monetary policy. Um, and there are also the distributional effects of how central banks spend the money um, and you know distributional effects are properly political questions not technocratic questions True. so exactly how central bank independence should function it's it's essentially a fungible thing i guess um, so exactly how central bank independence should function is i guess i i believe a question that needs to be debated rather than um, assumed but to my question um, most of our developed economies, it seems to me, and I'm not an economist, seem essentially now to be totally debt fueled. So given that, are we ever going to be in a position to, in inverted commas, normalize interest rates? Um, so could I just bring so, Panikos to answer that question? Or, 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 
Oh, actually, oh, well, I'll go with Panikos then, Vince. Well, I, I, I just don't see the, um, I don't see the link um, at the minute as things stand of um, legacy. I mean, the, de the debt is legacy, right? It's, it's not, it's not new spending, right? So what we are looking at at the minute, the new spending is just going to support um, the economy to prevent um, an even worse recession than we're going to have, right? So the legacy debt, I, I, I don't think it's 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 impacting on 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 interest rates at all, and we've seen that in the last few years. Um, since the, the, the global financial crisis, interest rates have come down and they have, they have stayed down. And all the, um, uh, all the forward guidance that we have from central banks is that they will remain low in the foreseeable future. So I, I just do not see that um, we are, um, unless we start spend, overspending and that we have, we have already talked about that we shouldn't you know, once you do respect the independence of the central bank, you're not going to you're not going to uh, be allowed to to do engage in in frivolous monetary financing. Just just about the necessary, what's necessary. So I just, I don't I do not think that that interest rates uh, at the minute in developed countries, right? Not not in in other parts of the world are, are going to be a, a big problem. I do think that investment is a point that Magda made. Um, a while ago, it's a very important point that she made. Actually, we need to we need to um, use this opportunity to do public investment that helps not just health but also education research. We've seen how important research is, right? Now I'm wearing my university professor's hat, right? <laughs> you need to protect um, research capacity, we, because you know when you need them, that's you never know when you need them again. But clearly, you know having that capacity. And the ability to respond quickly to this pandemic is because we have a very good research infrastructure there. We have the likes of um, Oxford doing the, the vaccine at the minute, right? Trialing the vaccine, but also many other universities, including my own, um, you know, helping on all kinds of research relating to the, to the pandemic. So we need to protect that. We need to think very carefully about that. And in Europe, it, it, is, it is the case that they are thinking about it with the European Investment Bank, at least. It's, it's sad that we are exiting from that but i hope that 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 the uk will also um, invest in public um, in in public infrastructure that helps growth in the long run and that could be also transport infrastructure right it's not just it is not just yeah. um, uh, okay uh, Panikos, can, uh, can I, and green obviously right it's it's there um, vince i think had uh, his hand up he wants yes, to yeah, just to go back to joe's question uh, which i think was essentially about um, the lack of equity, risk capital and economy relative mm. to the amount of debt. And there is an opportunity to do something about that. I mean, all these big companies that we're putting money into, instead of loaning them, I mean, the government should be taking a share of their equity, which is puts them in a healthier, less leverage position uh, and means that uh, the taxpayer gets some profit when, when they turn around, if hopefully they, they are. So that's one step. I mean, the second point to make is, you know, when we were in the coalition, we worried a great deal about the over leverage of the economy. And there were all kinds of suggestions about taking away um, tax relief from interest and things of that kind until we got the howls of pain from uh, small business, which are, you know, relying entirely on bank loans and so on. Uh, so it's a terribly important thing that we have to correct. And one of the things that worries me about this crisis is that we're going to get uh, private equity companies which are contributing to additional leverage, but which are going to survive because most of them are cash rich. Uh, and we get, we get into an even, even more dangerous dependence on debt than we were before. Okay, thank you very much, Vince. Um, so in true question time uh, style, I'll go back to Hugh. So Hugh, do you think any those comments answer your question but also I from your question I got the implication that you feel that we should actually increase inflation to uh, uh, re reduce the debt levels. No I, well I, I think that one of the challenges here is is making sure that everyone shares a framing of, of the question uh, and part of the purpose of the question was to tease out whether um, whether the framing or, or there's a consistent framing of it uh, so um, we 
quite often we can jump to the conclusion that governments have to be funded by taxation or by um, borrowing, um, which isn't necessarily the case in, for a sovereign currency issuer. Um, the, the issue is more to ensure that the money supply is, is, is uh, meeting the needs of the economy. Um, and so whilst money, the money supply is being withdrawn um, because people aren't, or it's, it's stopped circulating, um, it needs to be replaced by various means. Uh, the question then becomes, how do you take it out of the economy again? Uh, and as I see it, the, the options are, um, well, you either tax it out of the economy. Um, if you take them the, uh, an MMT view of it, um, or you let it continue to circulate, in which case it will, it will form inflation somewhere, either in asset prices, which arguably the, um, um, was, was the outcome of the um, quantitative easing in 2008, um, or in retail prices. Um, but uh, then you have to look through the mechanisms which Vince was talking about uh, in relation to how retail price inflation um, uh, picks up. So I, I think it's a very long and, and, uh, and a, a, a wide area, which I don't, you, you probably don't want to dwell on much longer right now, but I'm very happy to have that conversation. I think we need, we need another session <laughs> for that, Hugh. Thanks so much for that. Um, so I'm going to move on to a totally different but, um, subject, really interesting question from Bobby Dean about intergenerational fairness, so, um, which has been touched on by a couple of the speakers. So Bobby, I'm, I'm new to you. Right, yeah, I think Vince has touched on it a little bit already, but my question uh, was simple about how do we ensure that this financial recovery uh, is intergenerationally just, um, particularly thinking about the fact that a lot of people have just gone through their 20s um, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, and this now feels like another crisis to get over. So how we, how we bear that in mind, that sort of 20-year lag for some people in terms of um, the economic justice this. Yeah, so, uh, Patience, do you want to um, start with that question? Yes, I think one of the first things we do, or should do, is to take away the triple lock on the pension. Um, I'm not convinced that this government will do that, but it seems to me in the interest of intergenerational fairness, that would be the first thing to do. I'd be inclined to accept the inevitable and actually write off student loans because they're not being repaid. So we, we might as well face that now and stop taking interest from people who are going to be struggling in the labor market. And that would be a positive to do. But then I think we have to look at our tax structure, as I've said, um, and load it towards the higher earners rather than the low earners. And I'd also look at a wealth, well, not a wealth, something more on taxing property, because at the moment, you know, we need to probably do it by bringing in a higher level of council tax which would be a fairer way of doing things. So those who are trying to get into the bottom of the property market weren't facing an increase in their council tax charges. And I think intergenerational fairness is a long-term project. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Vince. You mentioned it in your um, opening remarks. In yeah, touch yeah. with the youth, Vince. Yes, yeah, am I unmuted? Yes, you're on mute. No, I mean, I agree with um, patience about the, the need to, to tackle the imbalance in property values, which has been artificially created to some extent by the monetary policy. Uh, and the taxation, he, he suggests, seems entirely sensible. I, I, I don't remember it. I remember it being rather controversial when I proposed a mansion tax, which essentially <laughs> was talking about. But, uh, you know, let's go back to it in a different spirit. Um, I'm not at all in agreement with the idea that the priority should be uh, to relieve uh, the tax on well-paid graduates, which of course is the effect of the policy on um, tuition fee loans, but I don't want to stir up that old uh, policy again. I, I think just reinforce the point that there really is massive intergenerational inequality. The, the, older population were completely spared the effects of austerity, uh, not just the, the triple lock, but even the double lock, which of course protects um, pensions in real terms. Um, you know, most of us also are topped up with a final salary uh, pension in, in occupational terms. Property values have risen and now 
the economy has been closed down so that um, the oldies amongst us, including myself, don't get sick. I mean, this is, and all the burden is being carried by young families, um, both loss of income, massive insecurity, mental health problems, lack of affordable housing, which, you know, it needs to be tackled really, really radically. Okay, well, thank you very much. The problem with this, this why this isn't really working as question time is all my panellists are agreeing on everything. You've got to start <laughs> like disagreeing and chatting at each other and things. Okay, well, well uh, uh, so in that spirit, so I just wanted to move on to the next question, which is uh, the dreaded B word. So, Andrew, you brought this up and, and having um, uh, someone in a Radix audience who actually believes in Brexit is, is, is a rare event. Oh. So, so welcome here. So, Andrew, have you, Andrew Slater, can we unmute you? There we go. Thank you, Nick, for that uh, bloody awful introduction. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, with coronavirus and Brexit, we've had two major shocks in uh, quick succession. In dealing with the financial repercussions uh, of the coronavirus on the UK economy, is it beneficial that the UK is now outside the European Union? OK, well, can I uh, ask Magda uh, that question as a... a joint Polish and British citizens. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I had a problem hearing this. Can you just, just repeat, uh, or is it just about Brexit? Well, uh, let me repeat the whole question because it yeah. was short. Uh, so we've had two major shocks in quick succession being uh, coronavirus and Brexit. In dealing with the financial repercussions uh, of coronavirus on the UK economy, is it beneficial now that the UK is now outside the European Union? Um, I think the only the only thing that helps is being an island, really, in this situation. Because you know, um, honestly, um, uh, I think as a you know as a newly minted Brit, um, I, I'm I'm really sorry to see the potential loss of cooperation, uh, information sharing, the scientific exchange, funding. Uh, participation in, in, in coordinated policies uh, or, for example, safe travel uh, channels for countries that are able to control their outbreak safely. Um, uh, and then also having a voice in if this leads to a new policy direction, say, towards China or rebuilding of production chains towards more slack and having more... Um, strategic or safety features within your production chain and trade channels, then outside of the EU, UK will just be a single voice of a small country on the edge of the continent, as opposed to being a large country within a large global player. Um, so I, I haven't seen the benefits of it before, and I see probably even less benefits now from a purely technical economic perspective. Um, so can uh, I... Uh, uh... Imagine all the panelists will probably agree with those sentiments. So, but did Patience Panikos or Vince have anything uh, to say on that uh, issue? Well, I think no. Vince, go on. <laughs> two things about Europe. Um, the European Monetary Union is potentially in desperate trouble for the reasons its panic has described in the decision yesterday. Their inability to um, create money. Uh, I, I fear a terrible crisis coming there, but. For us to be leaving one bit of the European project, which actually works, which is the single market, and is a benefit to everybody, is completely and absolutely bonkers. Um, but I fear that if Patience and I and everybody else preaches at the government, it'll just make them even more determined to go ahead at the end of the year. So I'm keeping quiet in the hope that common sense will prevail. Um, did I, either of the other two of you wish to say anything? I mean, that there is that actual European angle about the, the potential crisis going on in Europe. Which, uh, I think it was interesting uh, that, think, yeah. sir, that this morning, one of the EU commissioners pointed out perfectly logically that had we actually exited the EU by now, we would be undergoing a food shortage. Mm. And... That's why extending the transition period seems to be a no-brainer. I think Vince is right. Um, the government will have to get to this conclusion itself. It won't listen to anybody offering advice on this, but business can't cope with dealing with the consequences of coronavirus 
and simultaneously prepare for us leaving the EU. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so Andrew, did you want to come back at, well, and I don't, no one's on, raising their hands. Andrew, did you want to come back on that at all with your- or... my, uh, my motivation for the question was more driven by the debt that uh, is being taken on uh, and whether we as an economy uh, can afford uh, our own debt, let alone uh, the debt uh, of our neighbours, our neighbours which we will continue to trade and cooperate with whether we're in the European Union or not. Uh, therefore, uh, I was hoping for answers along uh, to, to, from that perspective, which I agree was not explicit in the, uh, in the question, uh, rather than uh, the sentiments expressed by the panelists. So I can maybe try to, to answer that. So uh, the fiscal and debt mutualization fiscal union is more of a part of the monetary union other than EU. There's obviously a transfer between rich and poor countries, but the, the aspect of um, mutualization only for the currency union. But if, if we're concerned about can we pay for the debts of other countries, shouldn't we then be also concerned about debts of, say, US, uh, which is, a, after all, a, a large partner of the UK as well, and even until now, with the full participation of the EU, the UK has not been really constrained in issuing its debt. It has one of the world's reserve currencies. It has its own central bank. It can introduce its QE, as it did in 2008, 2009. So um, I don't see a, a, a huge constraint on the ability to deal with the, the crisis and debt being in the EU or being outside. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So uh, I think we'll move on to another question. So the, we had two questions about MMT. I didn't want to get too sort of technical about, you know, uh, what MMT is or, or the detail, but it, it is um, a kind of fashionable economic theory. So start off with uh, Chris Anderson. And Chris, could you give me a very, very brief explanation of, you know, wh wh why we should be interested in, in MMT before you get on to your question, as you had it in your explanation. So Chris, sure. I think you can get going. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, so I, I should say MMT is something which anyone who's looked into it, so Hugh springs to mind, will know. Stuffers from amateurs like me describing it rather than practitioners. So I'd urge anyone with any interest that's more than entirely passing to go to people like Stephanie Kelton, who is uh, seeing more and more prominence in the FT, which is very welcome, I think. MMT, I would best sum this up as saying it's pointing out that for a country with monetary sovereignty, um, you don't need to worry about funding things. And tax is simply a, a means of removing demand from the economy. And debt to GDP for a government as a whole is completely irrelevant. It does not bind anything at all. So what it says is, if we want to manage inflation effectively, we should institutionally elevate tax and ensure that tax does the job. Now, there's clearly a credibility question. The number of people to point it out. And Independent central banks is one way of ensuring there's an institutional credibility that means that people are not worried that inflation will get out of control. But it seems to me that with the coalition's uh, introduction of the Office of Budgetary Responsibility, we actually have in the UK just the right kind of body that could step in if we wanted to move towards an MMT framework. And the OBR could score uh, a budget to say, Given the level of spending which you guys want to do, which you think are important for your priorities, the level of tax you put in, you've imposed alongside that, is too high or too low. Too, too high, meaning you're running the economy too cold, or too low, as in the economy will run too hot and there's a risk of inflation accelerating. So the OBR can police governments, I would hope. It's maybe naive, but the, the, there's the beginnings, it seems to me, of an institutional framework. So my worry is, as Patient said at the very beginning, um, people, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a widespread tolerance beyond those on this call now that the economy should be run more hot and there should be greater tolerance for monetary financing than previously. But as things start to recover, things will normalize. The, the, the narrative of uh, austerity will come back. People will start saying the nation is a credit, it was maxed out its credit card, this sort of stuff. And this will be very painful. Austerity will come back. I, I, I wonder if people aren't at all convinced by the idea that we need to rethink the institutional framework. Okay, so thank you, Chris. So, based, uh, in a very brief summary, it, it's 
the fact it's a kind of way of avoiding uh, um, uh, uh, austerity, austerity. We had another MMT question from Tom Abellis. So can we run those together? Tom, uh, I hope I mispronounced your surname. Um, I'm, I'm muting you if you could um, ask your question, please. Tom, hello. You, okay, sorry, I, I, I accidentally said to unmute it. Took yeah, me yeah, while yeah, I'll move okay, my okay, cursor yeah, yeah. to it. <laughs> well, I I appreciate what Chris had just said because uh, Stephanie seems to be the go-to person to look at uh, MMT or quantitative easing, but she cautions that it's short-term, not long-term, and that it's still problematic which means that we have now have a problem because of the a point that patients made that says, okay, now we're going to do Corona. Next, we're gonna do uh, universal basic income. We're going to do any one of uh, GND, you know, Green New Deal, a variety of these things, which are all long-term and uh, problematic under uh, a QE method of of financing and uh, it becomes more problematic if, because we're not in a monopoly game. In other words, monopoly is a closed world, but in the case of the coronavirus and all these other projects, we're in a global society. And we saw this with the 207, the 07, 08 financial crisis where QE was used very heavily and the money ended up going into the investment banking community. We're starting to see that now with Corona, with the United States money coming through the Fed and through some of these other programs that the money flows outside the borders and therefore it becomes a more complex situation than a closed system where the money goes out through QE and comes back in through debt repayment within the, okay um, so Tom, can, can i just stop you there because the questions are getting a bit long we haven't got so much time there's there's so a the whole question, oh go on the, the basic question is you know under a, a standard uh, neoclassical economic model of the way the banks are handling this it seems to me that qe is problematic and needs to be uh, carefully controlled Okay, I think there's a kind of whole range of issues in there. One, Chris was sort of suggesting a new institutional arrangement framework, I think, for, for uh, 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 between central banks and the OBR. And then there's a, um, a question about, if we go back to the last financial crisis, about we did quantitative easing, and that created actually uh, a lot, load of problems, including a wealth redistribution um, um, effect. And um, so I think, it, Vince, in your comments, you said you didn't want, you know, this to be used as to for a whole range of uh, pet projects like financing trips to the moon and things. So, um, but on the other hand, uh, there will be a huge bunch of distortions caused by all the uh, uh, government interventions. So, did you have any thoughts on on, on any one of the above subjects? <laughs> You're still on mute, Vince. Uh, I sense that in the last quarter of an hour, we're, we're all more or less saying the same thing, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, we use different language, uh, but actually, I think, and indeed, the institutions themselves understand that, you know, we have to have more expansive um, use of money in the short term, on a temporary basis, on a controlled basis. basis. I mean, there seems to be a remarkable degree of consensus around that. Um, but the one thing we haven't gone back to, which I thought was a very important contribution, which was Mag Magdalena's comment right at the outset, of course, that there are large numbers of countries in the world that don't have this freedom uh, of policy. I mean, either they're uh, countries with kind of fragile external credibility, you know, not just the Argentinas, but uh, more reputable um, countries, you know, the Turkeys of this world. And then there are the ultra poor countries that have absolutely no discretion, whatever. And I think we are in danger of forgetting about them. 
um, one of the big differences from the, the financial crisis is that then China and India weren't really affected. They just sailed through it and the uh, Chinese actually kept the world economy going. That's not going to happen this time. Uh, and we're going to have large numbers of absolutely crippled countries. Um, now, to some extent, the policies we've been talking about, expansion in the US, UK, Japan and Europe, if it happens, will kind of pull, pull people up again. Um, to a degree, but I think Magdalena's point that we're all being a bit parochial here and recognizing that large amount of the world economy is just going to be dragged down into the most terrible financial crisis without real help through aid, debt relief and so on is something we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, I turn to Magda then and say, you know, how can we avoid, uh, uh, what should we be doing for countries which can't help themselves? I know the... Well, uh, so, um, yeah, or those that can help with limited means. Uh, well, yeah, that standstill already has been agreed by G20 and a lot of the countries that are in the dire need of financial assistance have a lot of multilateral debt, so say to the World Bank, IMF, uh, and uh, European institutions, um, and then the discussions with uh, private creditors are also ongoing about suspending part of the debt payment so that at least you don't force them to use their crucial resources now to, to service their debt. Mm -hmm. um, I think what uh, the best way to help is really to indeed help financially and then just let them, let them grow, right? Let them become part of the global economy, export, continue with the growth, and uh, that will be on the economic side and on the uh, public side. Remember the great eradication of polio and other diseases. This was all done for free. This, there was no patents. Uh, there was a great international cooperation. And I think we need to come back a bit to that, that the health and um, uh, international system of this area is a matter of values rather than, uh, than, uh, than profits. Um, one very important thing that we need to raise here is also, and, and uh, Vince alluded to that, is uh, China will not be pulling the global economy as much as it did in 2008, 2009. But this situation also, China has lent a lot of money to these countries. Uh, we always worry about the debts to the World Bank and the IMF. For many of them, their loans from China exceed those, those loans. So in any discussion and in any help for them, China will play a very large role and will probably like to shift the weight of global governance and control towards its side uh, using that opportunity. Great, Thank, thanks Magda. I think because we gave you quite a lot of um, agreements, I'll try and introduce another uh, uh, awkward question. So from Will Flint, you have a question about uh, tax. Um, Will, could you uh, ask your uh, gun side for you to do that? Oh, you've done it as well. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm going to slightly expand on the question I put into Nick um, in light of what I've heard from the panelists. All the panelists agreed that there should be an element of taxation, not necessarily to raise money to fix the um, impending deficit, but to make a point that we're all in it together the money shouldn't go to the same people that it went to 10 years ago. Um, I just wonder um, that this smacks a little bit of um, uh, a political gesture that wouldn't that imperil the future overall recovery of the economy by scaring off the people who might actually help kickstart the economy and make the economy grow, which everyone seems to agree is where the ultimate prize to um, make the economy rebound is gonna come from. Um, therefore, is it right that Britain uh, should be going it alone and making these, um, I use the word quite cautiously, political tax raising um, actions, rather than just saying, look, I don't care whose fault it is, I don't care who's seen to recover best, I want to make sure that the economy recovers ultimately, and I will be. In, I want to be in step with the rest of the developed economies in encouraging growth, rather than um, taxing a political, a particular sector of the economy or the population. 
Mm. Okay, thank, thanks for that question. Can, can I, I just sort of add to, before I add, add an extra bit on that, uh, to my question, which is almost the opposite, which is the fact that uh, you have companies um, which have been avoiding tax or have been pay, um, doing share buybacks, which makes themselves less resilient. And then those companies are being um, supported by, by, by the government. Um, and it could, should the government then not say, well, you can't make yourself less resilient by doing share buybacks. You have to have fairer pay. You should be paying your tax. And only then are we going to, you know, uh, 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 support, um, um, support you. And, and I think Vince made the point was we didn't do that in the financial crisis. But what happens in a crisis, you can do that. But afterwards, you can't because, you know, the lobbying brigades of the big corporations get back in gear. Everyone forgets about it. The politi politics move, moves over. So in the crisis is exactly the right time to, 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 to do that. And in fact, it's the, the, the only time. And we saw what happened after the financial crisis is a great deal of anger and, uh, and you bankers have been bailed out and you haven't paid for it and, and nothing was was done because it dropped down the political lever. So Panikos, you were you were going to uh, yeah. uh, have a go at that. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I, I didn't I didn't talk about uh, you know I, I don't think I said anything about taxes um, in my in my introductory speech and I sort of avoided it partly because it is political even if you even if it is fair right. It's uh, I, I think that it's um, it's a bit premature. I th I feel. To be talking about who is going to pay higher taxes at the minute, and part of the reason for that is a political economy reason. It's the lobbying reason that you said. You you, you think that the lobbying will come back later? Um, I think we start talking about taxes now. The lobbying will start now, and the lobbying will be, let's not do enough. Basically, why do you want to spend on health? Why do you want to spend all this on supporting this other than the other, or bailing out big companies? If you're going to ask me to pay for tax, right? So the minute we start bringing in taxes, the minute that minute the lobbying and the conflicting interests start. So I like the idea so far in this crisis that we have this sort of community thing. We're all in this together, right? <laughs> the minute you, you start arguing about who is going to pay for it, then that you lose that. You lose no. that sort of. Um, you're not community. in it together anymore. Great. Yeah, you're not Thanks in so much. it together anymore. Uh, uh, can and I guess maybe? Becomes, uh, you know, why should we bail out Virgin? Uh, yeah. Why should we bail out universities? Cool. Right? If I'm going to have to pay for it afterwards. Cool. So um, there is that danger that we might be prematurely talking about taxes at, at the minute. Yeah. Okay, can I move on to patients who brought up that point about you very strongly in favour of, of, of having kind of redistributive taxes? I think this is the opportunity to do what people have been becoming increasingly conscious of, which is the need to rebalance society a bit. Um, what has become apparent in recent weeks is just how disadvantaged certain groups of our society are. And so I do think this may well be the moment when we can do the right thing and begin to even things up a bit. On bailing out companies, I think what we're talking about at the moment is preserving jobs. And so any bailout has to be very carefully geared to those companies that have a future. And that's why I'd look very carefully at airlines, for instance, because demand for flight is going to go down significantly in the medium term, I think. I love Vince's idea, by the way, of taking an equity stake mm. instead of making it a government loan. But I'd want to be very careful about what sort of businesses those were. But, you know, we missed the opportunity to build a sovereign wealth fund when we had North Sea Oil. And it's not a bad thing to do. So, again, this could be the opportunity to do it. But one very minor point I would make is that at the moment, the government is doing everything it can to keep companies afloat and preserve jobs. At the same time, short sellers are trying to drive those companies out of business. This seems to me absolutely crazy. I've never been a fan of short selling. It does seem to me that at least during this crisis, we should take steps to stop it. 
in, in a desperate attempt to to um, to get some some disagreement between the panel, Magda, can I ask you about short selling? Is, is there a do, do you disagree with with uh, patience? Actually, uh, I, I do have some some mixed views on that. Uh, short selling has been introduced, for example, in the EU um, after the two thousand eight crisis, and uh, it, it has worked well. Um, and I think. Uh, and I hope nobody. So uh, I, I, I'm, I think that there are limits to what the market should be doing, and there are clear uh, deficiencies of a completely free financial market. So introducing limits on certain uh, transactions is not the worst thing, and it doesn't mean that we are abandoning the the, the principle of free market altogether. Um, so. Um, but I think it is a minor issue in, in, in this discussion. I think the mar more, much more interesting issue is indeed the public stake in, uh, uh, in companies that if you really save somebody, you don't just give them a loan or grant, you, you can also take the, uh, to buy the stake in it. And that happened, for example, in case of some bank bailouts in 2008, 2009. Um, and, uh, and also they're just kind of very much more general thing of rethinking how the economy is run and uh, not not treating the presence of the state and the government as uh, presence of the state and the economy as a total uh, anathema. Um, so uh, even my old institution, the the IMF, has recently acknowledged that, for example, capital controls are not the end of the world. If you really need them, and if you need restrictions on the on the free market, the financial market, the completely unbridled financial markets, you can use them if that helps you preventing an external shock turning into a massive crisis. Yeah, okay, so can I say for future Radix events, we need to find, dig up some neoclassical economic economists <laughs> who disagree on things because we're not getting <laughs> any disagreements. Um, um, by the way, um, all these uh, Radix events are, are, are free, um, but we would be, um, we're setting up a, if you wish to donate or some money to Radix or, 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 or pay a, an honorary, P or whatever, how you call it, we would be delighted because we're 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 totally unfunded. Um, now uh, we haven't got very long um, to go. There was one question that I did want to discuss, which is about sort of um, uh, you know how should we land on a you know, should we bail out Virgin, high emitting company, and and or should we use the opportunity to you know, shut down a lot of fossil fuel companies and go to a green economy? So can I bring in Justine Lee Bell, who's my colleague at, at, at Radix, uh, sorry not Radix, uh, at Climate Bonds, um, uh, who uh, has a question on on, on a sort of post um, uh, 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 post COVID green stimulus. I think. Justine, okay. I've unmuted okay. you. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, yes, perfect. Um, yeah, so, yeah, thank you. It's um, actually been a really fantastic uh, uh, conversation, and thank you to the panelists for um, bringing a lot of this to the table of discussion. And, of course, at Climate Bonds, we are very much focused on how governments are going to uh, be setting in place their economic stimulus packages, and we've all been hearing and I've been seeing some of the side notes here around um, you know, greening those economic stimulus packages without say, sounding trite, but um, to what extent should we be seeing that? And particularly when we're looking at what's happening with the oil and gas sector uh, today and, you know, where we saw maybe 10, 15 year horizons with the industry, double impact of not just a price war, but also uh, COVID impact on uh, the, the weaknesses of the supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are we trying to bail out these industries that we know are, are, are taint in the next 10 years? That's debatable. Um, and are we not focusing on redirecting that capital into the industries that can create jobs, uh, divert those jobs into uh, a renewable energy sector, for example, without sounding too simple? Um, if we look finally at where the feds have now exposed themselves. Let's look at about 12 trillion of assets under management now, much of that rescuing the US economy from all the failed debt within the shale gas industry and now taking that into the feds. You know, that in itself is a looming doom ready to boom. So I need to hear from the panelists your thoughts on, on this. Okay, um, I suspect there won't be too much disagreement amongst panelists, and we haven't got, we've only got three minutes left of official time. I'm not sure if we can run over. So if the panelists would 
had any thoughts on on that particular question, but also wanted to do use the opportunity for a sort of round up remarks. So, um, patience, can I hand over to you? I think it's important that we don't keep zombie companies, as they, there are many around, that we don't use government funding to keep them going a little longer. We have to be fairly brutal about that. Uh, whereas younger companies, smaller businesses, those do provide an engine of growth. And I'd like to see investment uh, loans, capital directed towards them. Um, big businesses do still need help short term, but we need to be selective. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think it's quite hard for governments to um, decide on what a zombie company is or, 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 or not. And Magda, do you want to have green, green issues or, or um, rounding up comments would be great? I think that green issues are, are, are more uh, your forte, although I think this is a fantastic opportunity to, uh, to look into them as the, the new thing. For example, after the Second World War, which we compared the situation to a few times, the, so the, the Marshall Plan, say in the US, the GI Bill, all this, uh, uh, the interstate project, there were all these uh, great projects that helped to lift the productivity of the, of the economy. And we should try not to waste this opportunity and, 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 and use it to respond to, to challenges, the hit to growth, uh, so inequality and the, the climate change. Um, so I think that would be my um, just general comment that uh, while 2000, the response to 2008, 2009 crisis actually deepened the challenges uh, of the economies run in a very neoclassical economic way, um, we could use this to rethink the economic dogmas and uh, both in the monetary side and the debt management side, growth, inequality, investments um, as the way to, uh, to propel the economy forward. We've been always looking for this magical technology, technological jump, IT, that will push us far ahead, but maybe just what we need is us actually doing it. Okay. Well, thank you, Magda. On, uh, there's a recent analysis said that COVID has caused global emissions to reduce by 8%, and 8% is what we need to do every year to meet our climate change targets. So we need, you know, and, and this has caused a total shutdown of the economy, so that's the challenge. Yeah. Uh, Panikos, did you want to uh, say rounding thoughts? Well, to be honest, I'm uh, so much in agreement with everything that's been said before me that uh, I don't have much, uh, I don't really have much to add. I, I, do have, I do like the idea of equity stakes, uh, government equity stakes rather than bailouts. Uh, if they're going to do, they're going to help companies, I think it is a good idea. And that actually could help corporate governance, which is another issue that we are discussing in Radix, I understand. Um, I, I, I think that um, in general, it is an opportunity for um, to green the economy. So when they're looking to see who is worth saving or not, uh, worth bailing out, uh, that should be one of the considerations that they, they take into account. Um, so yes, it's, um, it's a good opportunity to, to, to turn the economy more, more green than, than, than it would be. But I, I wonder what, what the challenge is. It's, it's just far too big, given the statistic you just mentioned. With the lockdown, we are just achieving 8% reduction. I thought it was much bigger than that, actually. And, um, yeah, well, that's what I read you, recently. So, uh, <laughs> it was incredible. So f finish off with you, Vince. So Vince, um, and also um, you mentioned, and it's about governments taking equity stakes. And, and how would, as well as your rounding up remarks, how would that actually work? I mean, you need to, would you need to set up a, you know, a, a sort of a fund which is run at arm's length from the government to, to manage all the equity stakes? Well, technically, technically, it's not difficult. Sorry, am I OK? Yeah, 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 fine. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, technically, it's not difficult. We're, the, the Innovate UK do this at the moment with large numbers of small companies that benefit from innovation assistance. We do actually all acquire shares in the banks. Um, worked out well for Lloyds, not so well for NatWest. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, technically, it's not, a, it's not a difficult problem. What, what I would like to go back to is the quite important question that was asked at the end about the link between this emergency and bailouts and these big structural questions about greening and the rest of it. And I don't think we should confuse the two things. 
I mean, wh why would you want to let British Airways just go down tomorrow when their slots will be acquired by Emirates or China Airlines? I mean, you know, the long run, we need to move away from aviation and that requires the right set of um, price and tax incentives. Just um, not picking and choosing companies in, in the way people are suggesting is not helpful. And what do you do about the car industry? I mean, I run the industrial strategy for five years. We put an enormous amount of effort and some money into the car industry. Do we now say we pull the plug on Jaguar Land Rover? <laughs> um, no, it's a big structural question. The big car companies have got to adapt very quickly to electric uh, vehicles and uh, hybridization to some, to some degree. And that we shouldn't take our eyes off that question simply in order to uh, ease the, the, the question about which companies you bear out. Patience was right. The, the immediate task is to save viable companies um, and their jobs. Uh, we could then sort out later the big structural questions about environmental incentives. Okay, great. Well, I've got quite a lot to say about that point, but thanks so much. We've run out of time. Thanks so much to all the panelists, all the audience, all the great questions. Uh, ben, did you want to add anything? Just, um, no. just unmute myself, say, um, just no, thank you very much. Thank you to Nick for chairing and to all of our panel. Reminder that um, our next two sessions are uh, next Wednesday, looking at responsible capitalism and the impact that COVID will have on that. And then the following Monday on uh, China relations with, uh, between UK and China. And um, if there are suggestions or other things that people would like to uh, kick in, drop me in line. And also, if you would like to support our program, as Nick says, please do get in touch. Thank you very okay, much. Great. Thank you very much. I think if anyone wants to stay on for a chat, they're more than welcome to. Or to <laughs> I'm not sure how this works. So you can, you know, but, but stay if you want or go if you want or whatever. I'll, 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 okay, I'll go. Uh, uh, 10 minutes. Okay, yeah. cool. Great. So, Hugh, you had your hand up. Is that? No, I was simply applauding. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Night night, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Really enjoyed it. Oh, great. Thank you so much for your patience. I'm sorry about your uh, uh, I, 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 I meant to say telegraph. <laughs> No, don't worry, I'm just worried that people might think I'd prefer to be editor of the Sunday Times, of course, and I would have done that. <laughs> Patience, are you still taking the um, Conservative whip? In the no, race? no, no, yeah. I resigned from the party before, before the election. Yeah. Uh, I'm I, now I, what's I, known as unaffiliated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I assume that they wouldn't have been so happy for you out there canvassing with a chucker. Um, Quite. No, I, I resigned when I, I mean, I'm very much out of sorts with, with the party, particularly with the government. And it was a realization that I really did not want them to have a majority mm -hmm. after do the election. You, do you really think they're not, go, it looks like um, they're not going to um, uh, extend the um, um, negotiations beyond December? And, and I can't believe that. I mean, I believe, that, that seems such a stupid thing to do. It is such a stupid thing to do, but they are absolutely hooked on the Brexit ideology. Mm. And you know, it was one of the things that, that won them all those seats in the North, utterly madly, but nevertheless it was. And Johnson has faked his credibility on it, I think. Um, so this I, I, I indication. I, I, I agree with that, and, and I can see, but I can see, you know, when it come, uh, when it, I don't think they'd be undermining their credibility. So that we haven't had any time to negotiate, you know, let's just delay it six months or whatever. But they seem to be pressing on. 